documentary on the shark in a democracy the will of the people as expressed at the ballot box is sovereign and he said bertie we worked something out he says you're the only one in this room as far as we know that hasn't murdered somebody i enjoyed almost every minute of it and obviously i would have liked to have done it for a little while longer the first thing john major said you have to tell me about ireland i don't know anything about ireland or maybe the prime minister but i don't know anything about it within an hour i found myself in a lot more trouble than i expected to be in we are living a way beyond our means <laughs> The Irish government can no longer stand by and see innocent people injured. When is the general election likely to be? Well, it's not due till February next year, and it'll be sometime between now and then. It's in the interest of the country that responsibility should now pass to a, a younger man. The Irish nation was in a disgraceful condition under the external relation. We do not wish to seek quarrel with any country. The apparatus through which I am now speaking towards one very stimulating thought that gives no opportunity for the opposition to interrupt. following the 1916 rising, public support for Sinn Féin intensified. In the general election to the Parliament of the United Kingdom in 1918, 73 Sinn Féin MPs were elected. They refused to take their seats at Westminster. Instead, on the 21st of January 1919, they met as Dáil Éireann, and passed the Declaration of Independence. The same day the War of Independence began, it ended in a truce with Britain in July 1921. The Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed in December of that year. Though it was passed by Dáil Éireann, divisions over the 1921 treaty split the country and led to civil war by June 1922. It's often said that the Irish politics to the present day, the dominant parties are framed by, by the, the civil war split. I think that's the case. It's clearly the case. If you're trying to explain Fianna Fáil, if you're trying to explain Fianna Gael, that the easiest way to do it, the shorthand, is the civil war. De Valera was the political leader of the anti-treaty Sinn Féin faction. Pro-treaty Sinn Féin established the provisional government of the Irish Free State with Michael Collins as chairman. He becomes chairman of the provisional government in January 1922 uh, and that is, the, that is the effect the cabinet and Collins he's a titanic personality one can many views one likes but I mean he is a dominating domineering personality and uh, who knows how the whole position would have developed uh, if he hadn't been killed. Uh, he was certainly a very different personality uh, in the sense of forcefulness from Willie Cosgrave, uh, who in a sense became, you know, Taoiseach, President of Executive Council by default. After the death of Collins in August 1922, William T. Cosgrave succeeded him as chairman of the provisional government. So Cosgrave was much more a consensus man around the, the cabinet table. He inherited his cabinet, remember. Uh, so he found himself in a situation that was not of his making. I don't think Cosgrave was reluctant to take on the mantle of power. He didn't thrust himself forward 
he was quite willing to be a number two to Arthur Griffith, uh, uh, or possibly even to Michael Collins. Uh, but when those two uh, towering figures were removed from the scene, uh, he, he emerged. Now, there were more dynamic personalities like Kevin O'Higgins, like Owen McNeil, uh, like even Richard Mulcahy. Uh, there were strong people on the pro-treaty side. Um, but there didn't seem to be any argument about who was going to take over. There was no contest. I don't know, did he want it personally himself or how he felt about taking over the, the position of chairman of the provisional government? Whether this... I don't think he ambitioned the, the role, but I think that uh, when he had to take it on, he took it on because of his commitment to the state. I mean, mm. for reasons of state, the state had been established. Uh, the Union Jack was no longer flying in Dublin. 60,000 British troops had gone. For Cosgrave, this was a huge breakthrough. And that's the uh, motif, really, commitment to the state throughout his, exactly. his period. During the Civil War, the Irish Free State Government carried out a policy of executing their anti-treaty opponents. Liam Lynch, the Republican commander, had issued an order to the IRA saying that members, all pro-treaty members of the elected members of Joel Aaron and of the Senate and what were called prominent government supporters were now legitimate targets uh, for Republican assassination. And it's in that context that the government took a decision and said, if you want to play it that way, this is the way we'll play it. Cosgrave and the rest of the pro-treaty party in late 1922 were scared individuals. They believed that they were under personal attack and that therefore they believed that they, it was necessary to fight fire with even greater fire. And as a result, the, the executions are their response. Now, in order to do that, they introduced legislation which enabled uh, the very quick trial and execution of people caught for a large number of offences, some of which in normal times would be regarded potentially as quite minor, such as possession of firearms and so on. The British administration had carried out 24 executions. They had taken over a year before they executed IRA volunteers, and they'd had some disagreement about it once they did. The Free State Government executes 77 in a shorter period of time, so even by the standards, this is radical action. And I think, it, as I say, it does, it shows a particular determination on behalf of, of the, the pro-treaty government to maintain the state as, as, as they saw it. And for some of them, it does become almost an end in itself. I mean, there is a sense that some of them begin to glory in this harshness, um, even though, I mean, Kevin O'Higgins becomes a particular hate figure, and I don't think he, he should be singled out as primarily responsible. I think the entire cabinet were. But during the 20s, when he's confronted by hecklers about the 77, he says, we'd have shot 777 if we had to. And it becomes almost a macho thing that we've, we were prepared to go that extra step to save the state. They took a very clear, uh, cold-blooded strategic decision to try and basically terrorise the IRA out of the Civil War. This was done by Cosgrave. Cosgrave led his government because he felt that not to do so would have jeopardised the uh, future of the state, the f future survival of the state. And that's the key point, really, making sure the state succeeds. And as you said, the Union Jack is gone. It has to stay gone. The tricolour has to remain there. The executions began in the late autumn and early winter of 1922, and far from acting as a deterrent to further Republican activities, if anything, they acted as an incitement for Republicans to themselves engage in further acts of violence. The Free State Government simply wants surrender. The IRA obviously can't surrender. But what they do eventually decide to do is dump arms, which doesn't mean surrender, it means that you're simply uh, carrying out a cessation. The arms are going to be left for another day. And that's why de Valera's statement then, as the political, from the political point of view, you know, soldiers of the Republic, legion of the rearguard, victory must rest for the time being. 
with those who've destroyed the Republic, is again to the anti-treaty rank and file saying, right, we've lost this battle, but the war isn't over. But militarily, the war is over by the spring of 1923. But politically, of course, the struggle between pro and anti-treaty goes on. Maybe it's because I'm tired. Maybe it's because the dog's watching. Maybe that film did freak me out. Maybe it's something I ate, ate. Maybe it's the economy. Maybe it's something else. 50% of men over 40 may have suffered from some degree of erectile dysfunction. ED may be treated. Don't make excuses. Talk to your doctor. To find out more, visit manmatters.ie. She was possessed by evil, but this January, he will fight Mike Hell. Let's finish this! To protect her, the season of The Witch in cinemas now. Call the party line, 1550-6969-69, or text BLARD to 57333. Chat to single girls in your area, listen to hundreds of intimate personal ads, make friends, and maybe more. Party Line, the fun way to meet single girls. Call 1550-6969-69, or text BLARD to 57333. Watch out for the great 12-day VAT-free offer at Carroll Door Depot. Save 21% VAT on all stock items, doors, floors, tiles, and much more. Grab this exceptional VAT-free offer at all Door Depot outlets. Remember, it's VAT-free for 12 days only. DoorDepot.ie, Dublin, Cork, Galway, and Kells. Check out the incredible JML sale and save a third off. Add a touch of glamour to your outfit with Magic Scarf, the amazing scarf with eight looks in one. Got your hands full? You need the hands-free can opener. No effort, no sharp edges, no problem. Why not try Band Off, the must-have headscarf that gives you 12 stylish looks in one, whatever the weather. Now, a third off the previous RRP at all good JML stockists while stocks last. So hurry. Stephanie went to an house this morning and we haven't seen her since. She disappeared dinner time. He had the knife at my throat. He's over me, he's panting. He said, the only way you'll find slides is when she's dead. And as a woman, he's kind of done everything he, he can do to me now to hurt me. True Crime, The Girl in the Box, Tuesday at 8 on 3. The extraordinary thing about the Ireland that uh, after the Civil War was how quickly it returned to normality. There was huge damage, uh, to be, physical damage to be repaired, roads, bridges, buildings, rebuilding of large parts of Dublin. All that had to be done. Uh, the country's finances had to be put into shape. Budgets had to be balanced. And the government regarded that as almost the first priority, that they had to show that an independent Irish government could work. And it's interesting to look at the first budget uh, produced by Cosgrave's government, the estimates of expenditure. More than 40% of the entire government expenditure uh, was going on compensation and rebuilding. Uh, so it, was, it wiped out their capacity to do all the things that people expected. People expected that a new government in Ireland, an independent Irish government, would be able to deliver better services for people. Uh, than the British government had, uh, but because of the huge destruction that was wrought by the Civil War, that, that was impossible. Our newfound freedom gives us opportunities for the developing in our own way, untrammeled and uninterrupted. Our, the destiny which is the prime consideration of the founders of this state. There was, there, there was a genuine pragmatic limit on what the government could do because there was a limit to the amount of money they could raise. 
and there was limited amount of money they could raise, A, because they need to retain the confidence of the international system, but particularly uh, of the UK and UK banks, and B, because most people in Ireland were not disposed to accept high levels of taxation. So the idea that Cosgrave could have said, oh yeah, we'll have, we'll have a very high rate of income tax and a high rate, we'll have preschool, free preschool for every child, or free medical service, this is the 1920s, not the 21st century. Cosgrave uh, pushes, I think, the international profile of Ireland through membership of the League of Nations and also the um, Commonwealth uh, participation in the Commonwealth conferences. So he's there to uh, ensure that Ireland is perceived as being an independent, autonomous state, even if it only has dominion status. But for Cosgrave, dominion status is uh, the road to independence, is a stepping stone. It's freedom to achieve freedom. Soon after the Civil War, W.T. Cosgrave was faced with a crisis, which became known as the Army Mutiny, following attempts by Cosgrave's government to reduce the size of the army. The 1924 Army Mutiny is one of the most controversial issues in Cosgrave's uh, prime ministership. Now, what was the mutiny about? Well, the mutiny, I think, was largely about uh, disappointed expectations. To some extent, the group of officers who threatened to mutiny more than actually did mutiny saw themselves as followers of Michael Collins, and they claimed that the, the, the dream which Collins had held out of progress towards the United Ireland and so on ha, had been dashed, that their expectations had been, had been cruelly pushed aside. In practice, the mutiny is also about jobs and jobs for the boys, because many of the mutineers feared that as the army was being, you'd now say, downsized, radically downsized to about 15% of what it had been at the end of the Civil War, that they were going to lose their jobs. Cosgrave took to his bed, um, as is well known during the Army Mutiny, and this is quite often attributed to uh, um, a kind of a diplomatic illness. Uh, personally, I think that's a bit harsh because we don't know maybe he was very ill. We do have records that show that he kept in touch with events during the Army Mutiny, and we do have evidence coming from um, Cosgrave's wife, actually, which shows that he was very alarmed that Kevin O'Higgins was uh, using the army mutiny crisis as a way of asserting his own leadership. Cosgrave wasn't like de Valera, he wasn't a sort of a visionary or a strong leader. In many respects his role as um, president of the executive council was to sort of mediate between the, the different interest groups within Cumann Gael. So you had Republicans like Richard Mulcahy who had one foot in the uh, in the National Army and the IRA before that. And you had people who would have been not Republicans, like Kevin O'Higgins, who had a much more socially and politically conservative vision. So Cosgrave's very important role is in keeping all of these different factions together. My father uh, believed that the only solution to the crisis situation was his resignation. Maybe in the long run, uh, the best thing uh, was his resignation and the um, dismissal of the senior army officers because at least uh, the government was able to say to both sides, to get rid of both sides, you see, and therefore to, um, to ensure, perhaps ensure the continuation of peace. The great danger was that the civil war would start again if a lot of the peacetime uh, army officers had mutinied completely and gone off with their uh, almonds and all the rest, it could have started the civil war again. What he achieves for Ireland is to keep the state in operation through crises like the army mutiny, like the failure of the Boundary Commission, the civil war itself, and to keep the ship of state uh, on a fairly steady course, where other countries, you could talk about Poland. Like derailed. Yeah. That's a fair point. The Boundary Commission uh, was established as a result of the treaty. And the belief on the side of those who had signed the treaty was the Boundary Commission would recommend significant changes to the border between Northern Ireland uh, and the, what was then called the Free State, and that large chunks of South Armagh, Derry, uh, Tyrone and Fermanagh would come into, this, come into the South. Owen McNeill was the Free State representative on the Commission. There were three people. There was Justice Feetham from South Africa, there was a British representative, and there was Owen McNeill. And uh, 
Owen McNeil, to last moment, realizes that what's going to happen in the Boundary Commission is very small concessions will be made to the Free State uh, in South Down, South Armagh. And on the other hand, it will propose that the Lagan, the Protestant area of North Donegal, be given to Northern Ireland and not taken from Northern Ireland. Um, so they kill it. Cosgrave regarded this as a huge political setback, the Boundary Commission report. So he opened negotiations immediately with the British government, and the Boundary report was never actually formally published. Um, in return for accepting that the Boundary Commission wouldn't be published, uh, the Irish state was excused uh, the chunk of the British debt which it had agreed to sign up to in the treaty. Uh, but, the but the border with Northern Ireland remained the same. Well, I think the, the view of that government was they were never going to get anything successful from it, and the best thing to do was to try and get out and get out successfully and get out saving face as best as possible. Cosgrave, anyway, decided to go for the political solution by getting something out of the British in return for accepting the Commission's report, but it was hugely damaging to him publicly. Uh, it led to the rise of Fianna Fáil. A number of his own TDs were appalled that he accepted it. A number of them resigned their seats. Uh, Fianna Fáil won some of the by-elections and some of the people who resigned their seats ultimately joined Fianna Fáil. So the Boundary Commission and Cosgrave's acceptance of it uh, was hugely damaging for his government and for his own authority, even if he didn't have a choice. Since the ratification of the treaty, Sinn Féin under Eamon de Valera had abstained from the Dáil. De Valera was opposed to an oath of fidelity to the monarch. Anti-treaty Sinn Féin uh, is de Valera's party, because there's nowhere else to go, until he works out that there's no future in abstentionism. And that's what the break comes on in 1926, where he puts it to Sinn Féin that if the oath can be regarded as, you know, a, a matter of tactics and not as a matter of principle, and you can see the way he's shuffling towards how do you get into the Doyle, um, then we should be prepared to, uh, to enter the Doyle and end abstentionism. And he's defeated. He's beaten at the Sinn Féin convention on that. And it's only after being defeated, narrowly, but defeated, that he decides to forum Fianna Fáil. <laughs> It was an election in June of 1927 uh, when Fianna Fáil did well. They turned up at Leinster House. They refused to take the oath. Shortly afterwards, the Minister for Justice, Kevin O'Higgins, was murdered on Cross Avenue in Black Rock on his way to Mass on a Sunday morning. It caused shock the length and breadth of the country. People weren't sure if the civil war was going to start again. Cosgrave then, uh, at that stage, moved to bring in legislation uh, that would prevent anybody standing for election unless they agreed to accept the oath. It's now increasingly clear that Kevin O'Higgins was marked for assassination for s several months, certainly, by uh, the intelligence officers of the South Dublin elements of the IRA. Now, the actual specific circumstances of being shot are confused, but amongst those who did shoot him were people involved in tracking him. So this was going to happen. This did enable those who felt unreconciled by the 77 and those who been executed and those who had been uh, summarily executed, that they got one back. The legislation that is introduced in the wake of the Kevin O'Higgins assassination is uh, draconian, uh, but it does um, have the desired objective of uh, forcing Fianna Fáil into the Dáil, if de Valera had been temporising about coming into the Dáil. So in a way, uh, the, the, the terrible tragedy of the death of Kevin O'Higgins uh, had the indirect impact of bringing um, de Valera and Fianna Fáil into the Dáil and thus, in a sense, stabilising the democratic system. What Cosgrave wished to do was to humiliate Fianna Fáil, to split Fianna Fáil. There was no, absolutely no guarantee that Fianna Fáil would take the oath, even with, under the changed circumstances following the emergency legislation which was passed after the assassination of O'Higgins. So far from trying to, to bring Fianna Fáil into the camp, it was designed to drive a further wedge between them and parliamentary politics. It was, I think, to Cosgrave's surprise that de Valera ultimately swallowed his pride and took 
the oath. I think Cosgrave's calculation is we must have them in because we cannot have the gun as central in Irish politics. He knows that Dev is desperate to get in, right? And I think he probably assumes that Dev is wily enough to find a way of bringing his party in, despite all the principles that some would say were, were, were went up in smoke. Like in all things of politics, politics is the art of compromise, and normally it takes two to compromise. And basically, what happened was that they came in and the obligation was to sign a book, take the oath, sign a book with the words of the oath in it, and then you enter the doyle. He went in and he said in Irish, I'm not taking an oath to the British king. He covered the words of the oath on the book with some papers he had, and he laid the Bible on a chair or something that was in the room, at the far end of the room, and he went back, covered the words, and signed the book. Now, I have to say that that certainly is an empty formula. I do not see how anybody could claim that signing a book and quite, quite clearly putting it up to the person who had charged the book that you were not taking an oath, you were not saying the words, you were not taking the Bible in your right hand, is taking an oath. Obviously, if they had wanted to stop him, they could have said, look, until you take the oath, Mr. De Valera, you cannot enter the diet. But my honour, my, my, my guess is that Gumman and Goyal had decided to create an empty formula about this, that if they got the name in the book, they'd let them in. That if the British queried it, they could say, look, we got them to sign the book. The oath is written in the book. And on the other hand, the pragmatic politics was that they'd all done a little bit of sh shuffling and they had resolved the issue. I don't think he expected de Valera to be as effective in opposition as Fianna Fáil turned out to be. Even though they were rough, they were learning the ropes, um, they were acculturating themselves to responsibility in that sense. Uh, and at the same time, de Valera played a brilliant hand out of the doyle in terms of mobilizing opinion against virtually everything that the government did. Uh, so, Cosgrave, I think, I think Cosgrave found it hard to believe that he could lose, or the Fianna Common and Wales could lose, to so rough a bunch of boils as Fianna Foil were. This week on Ireland's Cocaine Wars. After the Declan Gavin murdered, there was a huge increase in intimidation. And the fear was that it was going to be a matter of time before someone was murdered. The gangland feud erupts into a full-blown war. The gunman shot Rattigan directly. As brother turns against brother. That level of violence, every killing has a ripple effect. Ireland's Cocaine Wars, a brother for a brother, Tuesday at 9 on 3. track with Gran Turismo 5 only on PlayStation 3. The game is just the start. I'm no good at chatting up and I always get ripped off. Enough to drive me to the brink but I don't do no washing off. The big sale! Just got a whole lot better. More doorbuster deals in computers, electrical, furniture and bedding. Unbelievable prices across a huge range. Big deals on laptops, digital cameras, sat-navs. Big discounts on TVs, washers, small appliances. Big savings on dining and lounge furniture, beds and mattresses. With deals so big, why shop anywhere else? See HarveyNorman.ie for more big deals. Harvey Norman's biggest ever big sale. Don't miss out. Go! 
Best. Looking for the best quote in home and car insurance? Make your best call. Call bestquote.ie. Bestquote.ie. Call the party line, 1550-696969, or text BLIRT to 57333. Chat to single girls in your area, listen to hundreds of intimate personal ads, make friends, and maybe more. Party line, the fun way to meet single girls. Call 1550-696969, or text BLIRT to 57333. With all the greasy food that can go through your dishwasher at Christmas, it could use a detox. For flawless performance, Finnish Dishwasher Cleaner has a unique dual layer formula. The blue layer targets grease, and the clear layer attacks lime scale. And a cleaner dishwasher means cleaner dishes. Finish the diamond standard. And try new Finnish Shine and Dry Rinse Aid. It removes the residues which can leave spots and smears, giving you sparkling dry dishes. She was possessed by evil, but this January, he will fight like hell. Let's finish this! To protect her, the season of the witch in cinemas now. Irish winters are full of surprises. Cold and wet one minute, bright and breezy the next. All that cold, changing weather may challenge your body's natural defenses. Packed with billions of exclusive LKCI cultures, Danone Actimel can help strengthen your natural defenses. A little weather's not gonna stand it our way. Danone Actimel, full of life. Mm, Danone. Beep, 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 beep. Need a number nifty? Beep, beep. Call 11850. Beep, beep. We're a friendly bunch in Ireland, so meeting people should be simple, shouldn't it? See someone you like, say how are you, have a bit of crack, take it from there. Mmm, that's how it should be, and it can be, with maybefriends.com. We've been matching people online longer than anyone else in Ireland. Maybe that's why finding someone so much easier and so much fun with maybefriends.com. Joining is easy, free, and only takes a minute or two. So why not see for yourself now, and who knows what could happen? Maybefriends.com. Dating with extra mmm. After almost 10 years in power, W.T. Cosgrave's government was under pressure in the Dáil. The party had been leaking support throughout the 1920s and in the late 1920s simply didn't enjoy a parliamentary majority. It therefore made sense, as far as the Cosgrave government was concerned, given that the economy was continuing to experience a downturn, uh, after 1929 to go to the country as early as possible rather than wait on the basis that if you waited the, the, it was likely that you were likely to experience a, a heavier defeat. So Cosgrave took a risk. Ireland is in the midst of the most fateful election the free state has ever known. And when Mr. Cosgrave, who for 10 years led their first administration, opened his campaign in the capital, one of the largest crowds ever seen gathered on College Green. For many days, feelings have been running high, but General O'Duffy, Chief of Police, took no chances this time. Spread about amongst the great throng, which must have numbered over 30,000 people, were hundreds of civic guards ready to quell the slightest disturbance. And it's a great tribute to the police that the meeting was held without a single hitch. Mr. Carsgrave, in his speech, said, Our policy is to remain inside the British Commonwealth of Nations and to secure for the Irish Free State all the privileges that go with membership of the great community of nations. In 1932, uh, Carsgrave loses the election. At the time, it comes as something of a shock and a surprise to him. Afterwards, he writes to a, a colleague in old age, we appeal to strength, whereas they appeal to weakness. He, in other words, he saw Fianna Fáil as a group of chancers who would offer the electorate anything in return for power, whereas he saw himself and his colleagues after 10 years in government as offering only what could reasonably be offered given the economy, uh, given the international climate and so on. 
and he always carried with him, I think, to the end of his days, a sense that by being responsible, Cumann and Gale had lost out in, in electoral politics, that had they been more irresponsible, more reckless with the public finances, with statements about Northern Ireland or whatever, that they might well have continued in government, but they've been government of a country which is bankrupt. They really just saw themselves as the government, really. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that was it. They weren't a party. They weren't yeah. uh, a force for anything within the country itself. They governed the country, and that's, you could take it or leave it. Yeah, they'd never been in opposition, so they didn't see the, yeah. the, the transfer, and then they're going to be in opposition for the rest of their political lives, most of them, after 1932. They take too much for granted. <laughs> When Fianna Fáil won the 1932 election, there was talk that of an army coup, that basically some of the people who had supported the treaty were talking about uh, preventing de Valera taking office. When Eamon de Valera enters the dial, you have to understand, nobody knew what was going to happen. We now know at the end of the thriller that nothing really happened and that the change over government uh, happened uh, smoothly. But it is true to say that the Republicans has brought uh, guns into the dial on the day of, of the election of the government. They were needed, thanks be to God, and of course, duly, in a democratic fashion, the Free State Government handed over power, and that's a huge tribute to William Cosgrave, who accepts the will of the people and hands over power. It's sometimes suggested that Cosgrave should receive credit for handing power over to de Valera in 1932. I've never been quite convinced by that argument, on the basis that, in parliamentary terms, there was no way that uh, Cumann and Gael could stay in power. Uh, and the only alternative was a coup. It seems to me inconsistent to suggest that Cosgrave should receive credit for his consolidating democracy in Ireland in the 1920s, yet at the same time seek to further congratulate him for accepting the democratic will of the people in 1932. You can't have it both ways. Dublin is again right in the news, and there's Linster Hall, where Mr. De Valera, now Republican President of the Irish Free State, and his cabinet of members of the Fianna Fáil party, have replaced Mr. Cosgrave and his party. 24 hours after his election, Dublin jail gates were thrown open, and 20 political prisoners were released and had as wild a welcome as only an excited Irish crowd can give. His first substantive move when he became president of the Executive Council, Taoiseach, was uh, to release the IRA. The IRA leaders were released from Arbor Hill and the prisons where they were held. And he took the attitude <clears throat> that he, a Republican government was now in place, that all that was necessary uh, to realize Republican aspirations was being done and that there was no need for an IRA. He also said that they were going to dismantle the treaty and he also promised very radical programs in relation to uh, social development and economic development. And it's interesting looking at Ardash speeches in the 30s the amount of emphasis that was put on production, on the development of the economy of the country. Uh, and uh, the 30s government, when it came in, was very radical in that direction. He then comes in and he inherits an army in the civil service that obviously is the Free State Army and the Free State Civil Service. Ono Duffy was initially the uh, commissioner of the Gardaí, and he sacks Ono Duffy. Uh, Ono Duffy then sends up the Comrades Association, which became the Blue Shirts, which was semi-fascist, and they threatened the stability of the state. When O'Duffy becomes leader of the Blue Shirts, though, I think de Valera is perhaps a bit less cautious. Um, he's certainly willing to use the full power of the state to suppress the Blue Shirt movement. Um, he attempts to ban the Blue Shirt 
the wearing of the blue shirt. He very quickly raids blue shirt offices. He uses all his powers to make it as difficult as possible for the blue shirts to exist as a political organization. Which, you know, were easily enough to put down because they had the, the aspect of continental fascism, shirted movements in Ireland. It was easy enough to discredit them. And their leader, uh, General O'Duffy, wasn't a political leader. He was a military leader. And um, he was a subscriber to the oral Irish tradition of John Jemison, Paddy Flaherty, and so on. So his speeches were far from political. They might be written in Dublin by Cumna Nail uh, speechwriters, but what he would actually say down the country would be, in the words of somebody who quarreled with them, hysterical and destructive. The National Guard is strongly opposed to anything flavouring up a dictatorship or a coup d'etat, and was brought into being to assist the people in their efforts to oppose any departure from democratic and representative government. During these days, when the names of our three great leaders are on everyone's lips, I very earnestly appeal to the Irish people at home and abroad to support the National Guard in reaching the goal of Griffith, Collins and O'Higgins. An Ireland united, peaceful, prosperous, free, and honoured by our own children. So it wasn't hard to break up that movement and he reintroduced all the trappings which he had invaded against under Cumnan Ale, the military tribunal, for example. He reinstituted that, and very cleverly, he used it to put down the, um, the blue shirts. And only then did he turn on the IRA. The, the argument that's put forward by Fianna Fáil and De Valera by 1936 is that there's a new IRA. They argue, just as the Free Staters had done in 1923, that the IRA of the 1930s bears no relation to the IRA that they had fought with from 1919 to 23 themselves. They argue that the new IRA is, in De Valera's words, a racketeering organisation, a gangster organisation. It's not the same as the old IRA. And therefore, this gives him you know, some um, legitimacy in his own mind, probably, in terms of banning the organisation. He also then, at every turn, through the 30s, uses every opportunity to step by step, literally, to dismantle the treaty until it culminated in the Constitution of 1937. Something jumped out, and it's never been mentioned before. Then she's brought here in a car by the man that she's meeting. There was no trace evidence. We had nothing. Where he plays, where he works, where he kills. Delve into the psyche of a killer. Crime in Mind starts Monday at 9 on 3. You sweet girl. This is your moment. Our new swan queen, Nina Sayers. You're gonna be amazing. Just as funny there. Someone's destroying you. What happened to my sweet girl? She's gone! Black Swan in cinemas January 21. Switch to Imagine WiMAX today for 50 euro worth of free mobile calls. Free text Imagine to 50015. That's Imagine to 50015. Terms and conditions apply. The Shelburne Hotel in the heart of Dublin, at the heart of Irish culture and society for almost two centuries, has hosted many unique moments in history. Enjoy your own special Shelburne moment this new year from just 94 euro per person sharing. Call today or book online at theshelburne.ie. Every time you start your car should feel like the first time. Now at Toyota, every new car registered before January 31st comes with three years free servicing, including the Avences, from just €20,995 with scrappage. Talk to your Toyota dealer now. Call the party line, 1550-696969, or text BLART to 57333. Chat to single girls in your area. Listen to hundreds of intimate personal ads. Make friends and maybe more. Party Line, the fun way to meet single girls. 
Call 1550 69 69 69 or text Blurred to 12-day VAT-free offer at Carroll Door Depot. Save 21% VAT on all stock items. Doors, floors, tiles, and much more. Grab this exceptional VAT-free offer at all Door Depot outlets. Remember, it's VAT-free for 12 days only. DoorDepot.ie, Dublin, Cork, Galway, and Kells. At the Star, we're passionate about sport, and whether it's soccer or GAA that sets your young heart racing, we'd like to raise your game by kitting out your school or club team in brand new Umbro gear. It's called Kids for Kids. If you dream of playing for Ireland, don't miss Kids for Kids, only in the Star. Just fill out the registration form in the Star tomorrow and all this week. It's Kids for Kids, and it kicks off tomorrow only in the Star, where sport matters. Did you know you can get great quotes from insure.ie for all your insurance needs? Including home insurance, <coughs> health and life insurance, travel insurance, car insurance, and ooh, pet insurance. Log on to insure.ie or call us today for a quote that'll make you smile. Just be sure to be insured with insure.ie. With de Valera in power, the relationship between Ireland and Britain began to change dramatically. The period 1932-38 is a period of, of huge constitutional achievement. Um, what de Valera achieved, not only as Taoiseach, but also as the Minister for External Affairs, which he insisted on holding himself, he brings about a complete revolution in the relationship with Britain. In effect, he makes Ireland as independent as he wants it to be. To my mind, the hope for the world today is in each country making itself as economically self-sufficing as possible, each confining its purchases from outside to what it is altogether incapable of or clearly quite unfitted to produce. I, I think his economic policies were, they ranged from being bad to disastrous. One of the provisions of the, the treaty uh, was that Ireland had to pay for the old land acts whereby uh, settlers, landholders, were bought out and they retired to England and then their estates were broken up. Uh, the Land Commission gave out the land to Irish farmers. And uh, this was a very popular policy retain the land annuities. Of course, a lot of people voted from thinking this meant they wouldn't have to pay the land annuities, but it meant that they wouldn't. They were retained in the Irish Exchequer, not sent over to England. In the dawn, I said that it was our intention to give a substantial permanent reduction in the annuities which the farmers were paying. I knew we were going to unite the Irish people and bring together the people who were marching together in the past, but I didn't think we'd reunite them so quickly as to get Mr. Cosgrave at last to see that the Irish tenant farmer couldn't afford to pay these annuities and send them over to England so easily as, as he was in the past. And the British retaliated by putting an ad valorem duty on all Irish products, notably cattle, because that's really the main industry, the export of cattle. And this meant that um, 
the cattle trade was wiped out. Uh, you could buy a calf for two and sixpence. People took cattle to the fairs and left them there. I remember going to Connemara in the 70s. And this thing all came back to me because he was praised De Valera hugely, if you know for the free beef. But actually what the free beef came about is you couldn't sell the cattle. So what they decided to do was start the cattle and give all the poor people in the country free beef. So you had this extraordinary situation where they turned adversity to huge advantage. And there used to be a saying in Connemara, because she fell out of mouth, he put meat on the table, because she broke her in the day, he put shoes on the people. It was all bound up with being anti-British, with being pro-Republican, and the cause and the national issue, and we are not retreating, we are advancing. Nobody ever asked him, what are you not retreating from, or what are you advancing to? But the rhetoric was loud, and it was commanding, and though it was very destructive, ultimately. The expansion of the home production of industrial and tillage products, which these statistics show us, has been a great factor in enabling the Irish Free State to meet the special difficulties which have been placed in the way of our export trade in livestock and livestock products since 1932. We are becoming less and less dependent on external markets for the sale of our produce and on external sources of supply for the commodities acquired for consumption at home. Protectionism meant that you put tariffs on other people's goods coming into your country in order to protect the development of your own industries. But you've got to remember the 1930s is that everybody's playing the protectionist game. This is the Great Depression. And de Valera and Fianna Fáil are lucky in a way because they can play the green card in explaining why they should not be blamed for the economic crisis and for the recession. Because when de Valera refused to transfer the land annuity payments to the British Treasury, and when he insisted that he was entitled to retain those in Dublin, the British, who were upset that de Valera had come to power in 1932, and who at that stage were hoping that he wouldn't last very long, they imposed tariffs originally. They imposed tariffs in order to recoup the money that they were losing on the annuities. De Valera then responded by imposing tariffs on British goods coming into Ireland. And so you had the economic war of 1932-38. We want our liberty so that our cooperation with Great Britain may be one of harmony and friendship, and to remove every obstacle to the natural growth of good relations between the Irish and British people. Politics when de Valera's T-shirt, they're not about economics. Politics are about independence and about how independent Ireland is going to become. And de Valera's great contribution, in many ways, is to solve the problem of Irish independence. He saw in the abdication crisis a fantastic opportunity. So the King of England winds up being King of Ireland one day longer because he delays the introduction of the necessary legislation in the Dáil by a day. And what he does was he wrote totally new legislation taking the King out of the internal affairs of this state. And it took him that extra day to prepare the legislation and get it through the Dáil. Um, his belief was that the British were so busy with their own problems that 